Hi, everybody. Welcome into the MTOM podcast studios here at Iowa PBS. I'm Paul Yeager. Glad to have you here on this new episode where we are going to talk about an old issue, the Farm Bill. Jonathan Coppice is a professor of ag policy at the University of Illinois. He's also a former Washington, D.C. staffer. He knows the ins and outs of making a farm bill happen and the challenges of. We're going to find out what challenges are out there right now in this legislation to, to an extent when it comes to discussing policy. And there's a couple things I wrote down. I need to check my notes here. We're going to talk about historical uh, context. Have we seen this type of rhetoric or lack of action and or lack of action in a farm bill before. We'll get a little historical perspective there. We're also going to talk about the issue of vote counting and amendments. And maybe it's time to just kind of put some things out there and just see what happens. We'll also get into the timetable of when we may see action. And if we don't see action on a farm bill by a certain date, boy, there's some big challenges ahead. It is a presidential election year, so politics clearly at the center of a lot of this debate. If you have any feedback for me, send me an email at paul.yeager, that's Y-E-A-G-E-R, at iowapbs.org. If you like this podcast, a comment is always appreciated. If you don't like it, send me feedback. We'll chat. Maybe you have a good topic that we should cover. But for now, let's talk about farm policy and our friend Jonathan Coppice. This is going to be a pretty short conversation when you have no farm bill <laughs> progress anywhere. Am, am I misreading the news reports, the staff reports, the lack of action on a farm uh, committees? Is this thing just stuck? Yeah, well, Happy New Year to you. Yeah, Happy New Year, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you again and talk to you again. I, You are not misreading anything. Uh, it is stuck. It is at an impasse and has been at an impasse for a while. Um. You know, some of the latest sort of reporting uh, is probably reinforcing that as much as anything, in which, uh, in particular, Chairwoman Stabenow has been has sent a letter to her colleagues and has sort of kind of laid out some basic principles. Um, the way I look at it or interpret it is uh, she's not getting much of a response. Uh, I, I saw some also reporting that, that ranking member Bozeman made some comment about putting something on paper or a spokesperson says I'm not putting it on paper, which my first thought was, well, that should have happened a year ago. It's not a good sign that we're a year into this and the ranking member has yet to put anything down as to what the priorities even are. Or since we know it's a reference price conversation, what are the reference prices that we're looking for? Um, and so that's the Senate side. <laughs> that's the more, uh, that's where we have our strongest optimism that that uh, the, the Senate can be more functional. The House, as you've seen, um, is just an incredibly difficult situation. I mean, I I kind of liken this to not really having a functioning ma majority, and because of that lack of a functioning majority, it's really hard to get things together. Um, there seems to be just substantial resistance to anything bipartisan, which is what we would think a farm bill would would be. Is bipartisan, and they don't. And seem traditionally like has been. <laughs> it has been, and they don't seem to like anything else they're they're putting together, or at least some of them don't. I shouldn't say that about everybody. I, there is really just a small faction in the House that is a real problem on on in terms of making progress. But when the majority is is slim, a small faction can hold everything hostage. So and I'm going to guess, more, Jonathan, any optimism has to have probably left given the uh, this movement on the immigration bill where well, I, I mean that was that was something where if you read the political stories of the democrats were basically handing a victory to the republicans in the election as a whole not maybe necessarily the presidential so i read that as we really are not going to see anything done in these next 9 months 10 months so you raise, yeah, you raise, which is like the, 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 you know, if you think of our, we're, we're sort of hanging on the cliff of optimism here <laughs> by our fingernails. Uh, somebody just, that just stepped on one of our fingers, if not three up, right? That just really does uh, cloud the legislative picture if they can't get to that sort of, I mean, here we have a, just a tragic problem at the border and it's getting worse and the, and it's complicated and it's difficult. And you're right, there, there is a deal in front of Congress right now 
that maybe nobody likes all the way, but has a lot of what people, uh, what, what, what constituents want, what we need to see. And it appears to, uh, it appears to be hanging on by, by its own, uh, uh, thread. And if, if you can't get that through, I don't know what that signals again for the farm bill. Um, I don't know kind of how to factor that in. But, I, but it does, it feeds this, this overall pessimism, right? It feeds this sort of really challenging outlook for things because, because we do not have functioning, we don't have a functioning legislative branch and that, that makes it really tough. Um, now, look, can these things get resolved? Sure. You know, we've got to get funding the government done and we've seen maybe some potential progress there. Uh, the 2018 Farm Bill got held up on the House floor over immigration. So it's not as if we haven't seen that again uh, as well. I'm sorry, I cut you off. You're getting ranted. Basically. Well, no, I was going to, uh, you, you, I guess let's peel the curtain a little bit. You were in DC yeah. last week, right? I Physically? was. Physically? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's you've start. got friends there. You worked there. You live there. Do they have any optimism? And I'm not trying to out your friends or anything. Yes. Yes. Friend, um, first of all, I wasn't there for farm bill purposes. I, I was there for actually a very fascinating workshop, uh, uh, at USDA on, on other issues. But it's hard to um, it's hard to answer that because particularly the staff that are involved in working on a farm bill, like you don't have a choice. Your job is to work on this and to grind and grind and grind through it. And so I think at the staff level, I mean, I compliment uh, them for what I can imagine behind the scenes. I actually don't have a lot of of. Uh, I don't have a lot of intel on this at this point because, again, I think it's just it's at an impasse. But I do know from my own experiences what's probably gone on behind closed doors and 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 in the meeting rooms and whatnot is just a a just constant grind to try to find a way forward. Uh, having worked for Chairwoman Stabenow, I know she is relentless in trying to figure this out. And I, you know, I don't pretend to be objective when it comes to to how she legislates. I think she's in just an incredible legislator. Um. And so I have a lot of confidence that she's trying to find a way. I just, I'm really concerned that, you know, she cannot do it alone. There has to be votes on all sides of this, of these issues, and there has to be a, a path to compromise. And if we're not seeing it, uh, particularly from the ranking member, then that's raising the challenges. We're not seeing that sort of, here's what I want to, here's what I need to see, or what, here are the parameters, here's the deal. Um, you know, there's only so much, uh, that any one member can do or even a chair can do. And so I'm pretty certain that you've got a lot of work going on. And that's where I find optimism, Paul, to be honest with you. Like if, if you're asking me for why I'm still hanging on to the cliff of this, it's like, look, I, we've seen this. I lived through it when what became the 2014 Farm Bill, where there seemed to be no path time and time again. And people like Chairwoman Stabenow, we worked and worked and worked to try to find a path through it. So if there's a chance for, op if there's, a reason for optimism it is that that work is continuing. We may not see it. And out of that, you know, constant grind and push that, that there may be something, right? There may be a, a chance to find a compromise. And once they do, then you got to find a path through Congress. But, but at least let's get that first step done. Okay. Historically, though. Yeah. Let's not even go 2014 and, and the challenges that we had. Have we ever had anything like this? In the history of this, I mean, this is a bill that goes back decades, several decades. Nine of them, to be exact. Yeah. <laughs> Do we ever find in your, I guess you're, you know, you're in the study academic look from the back business now. What can you point to students who are like, have we ever done this before? How do you answer that question? I mean, that's the nicest way I've ever heard anybody call me a geek. So I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Words matter, Jonathan. Yes, yes, yes. As a geek. Um, no, it, it's a great question. I think, and, and I, I've been trying to figure out how to um, write this, let alone say, it, like, uh, how to work this out in, tor in terms of the historical context. One of the things it reminds me of um, when you look back over is, is some of the impasse and problems we had in the 1950s and early 1960s. There's some goods and bads to that, right? In that stretch of time, we had, uh, for example, the Agricultural Act of 1956, which included the Soil Bank, 
Eisenhower had to veto the first version of it and send it back to Congress and tell them this is not the path we're taking, right? And it was a big fight between the administration and the Southern Democrats on the committees in Congress. Um, so that's an example. Uh, and they eventually found the way through it, right? I mean, they, they did, although they, the soil bank did not, uh, did not give much of a chance to succeed. And we saw things unravel right into the 1962-63 debacle um, in which I would, I would say looking at the history, it was probably one of the lowest points for foreign policy and its, and its existence. Now, the upside was the way they found their way out of it was food stamps in 1964 was paired up to help, help gather votes because the, the farm coalition that was moving that legislation had really just tore itself apart. So there's some historical examples. Uh, I don't know where that next kind of coalition building uh, potential is if, there, if something like that had to happen. I do think the coalition the Farm Bill has now is extraordinarily powerful politically and it's an extraordinary vote counting mechanism, um, as well as being important in terms of the policy benefits it delivers across the country to, to multiple groups of constituents. But I just think there's this bigger challenge we're seeing in Congress, this, this inability to work together, work things out, and I mean, disagree productively, right? And, Part of the whole point of politics and policymaking is we have disagreements and we work them out, but it's got to be a productive effort and we're not seeing it. And so I don't know that we have a, in the history of foreign policy, I don't know that we have that set of scenarios to work through. We've had some significant problems in the past, you know, the mid nineties, the 95, the 96 range was really difficult as well. Um, but I don't have a great historical kind of analog to say, oh, well, and, you know, 47, they did this and they worked it out that way. This was a little bit different. But I look at the country as a whole, and then I look at individual states. Yeah. Minorities have had a hard time. Minority parties have had had trouble getting anything done. It's been the majority party, whether it's Florida, Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, when they're in the majority, whichever party it is, they seem to be controlling things. Are we to the point yet? Let's go back to maybe putting a finger on back onto the cliff to hang on <laughs> that the path forward is absolutely bipartisanship and no longer just one party pushing something through. I think the answer to that is yes, that. That, that the way through Congress, and this is one of the challenges with comparing state level uh, legislating a policy making to the national. And I don't, I mean, we could get into a, a long philosophical discussion here if we're not careful, uh, and I'll try to stay out of that too much with you, but it's a great question, right? One of the challenges we see is the levels of faction, you know, the sort of breaking apart that we see at the, at the national level, which gets in, in, included in Congress. And the way Congress was designed, it just has a lot of these, these uh, bottleneck points or veto points in which any small group can, can, can really bog things down or blow things up. And so it's hard to work through those. And I think um, particularly things like the 60 vote threshold in the Senate anymore, uh, this rule, this sort of standing uh, procedure in the House in which a majority of the majority has to agree to something, right? Like those sort of things really really complicated. Uh, but I do think, look, the system was designed for exactly what you're talking about. You've got to be able to pull together enough factional interests to sort of, whether it's bipartisan or by region, you know, multi-regions, multi-factions, like the way you clear the hurdles in Congress is you build that coalition. It can't just be one, one side, one issue, one faction getting its way. It was designed to force uh, that coalition building. Like, that's basically why it's so difficult to do. Um, so we've got to see it. And you're right. Where, where we find that optimism is, you know, at this sort of the grinding difficult work to build that up, to put those pieces together. And then eventually I think some people, you know, are just going to have to be kind of pushed. They're going to have to be pushed to a situation of, are you, are you going to vote for it or not? Like we can only negotiate for so long. We're going to have to try our best. We have to put something forward. And, and say, okay, if you don't like this, what's your amendment look like, right? That's, that's the other thing that I, I feel like we're, we're missing in some of this conversation. You have a chance. If you disagree with legislation, 
instead of blowing up the process, have an amendment. I mean, the beauty of the legislative process is vote counting. I, I, I will say this over and over again, right? You can find out whether your idea is popular very quickly. Do you have the votes to win? And if you don't have the votes to win, then maybe that should be a signal that your idea doesn't have what it takes. And so I would love to see a more open process. Uh, we went through hundreds of votes in 12 and 13 on a farm bill. And it was a really cathartic process for many members. Members got to come out and demand what they wanted, and, a, and most of them lost. And you know what? Fine. You had a chance. You made your case. The votes weren't there. That's honestly where I th see this having to resolve itself is on the floor with like votoramas or something, some sort of process by which you get a chance. You don't like the way a uh, SNAP program works, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, bring an amendment. And if you can get enough votes, then your view just won and you are validated. If you don't, you lost, move on. Like other people have their say too. <laughs> well, there's two things that I'd like to, I'm very intrigued by the vote counting aspect. I'm also intrigued by what you just said about the floor openness. Yeah. Do you think we have seen the legislative process go a little less in the light to protect it, to get to the floor in a way that, those oppos those in opposition can't rally a base with emails and tweets to flood offices with phone calls to say, please do not let my representative vote for this. <laughs> that is a difficult question. Um, and in only two minutes, because class yeah, is about to minutes, start. Um, I, I think, I still think, and I get, I know why we close these up. I know why they're protecting these things and using rules. But I still think that at the end of the day, even with the cacophony of craziness that we see from social media, at the end of the day, the vote counting has real value. And I, I will argue until proven wrong, and Lord knows it's probably easy to prove me wrong, that you gotta, you gotta sort of. Uh, you got to have a chance for the disagreements to be aired and for people to see they don't have the votes. And look, that's tough. That's tough for leadership. They got limited time. They got a lot of stuff to work through. They don't want to spend weeks on a farm bill. I get it. But at the end of the day, if we're stuck and we can't move it, you know, maybe that chance starts at the committee and just get a bill out there, get a mark. And, and if you don't like it, bring an amendment and, and just open that conversation. I know that may sound, uh, you know, like I'm over... I'm making it sound too easy. That's somebody who tried to count votes a few times. Like, I, I apologize to my friends on the Hill that I just opened that even thought, right? <laughs> it's going to be a lot of work. Um, but with these kind of impasses at some point, it, it's a question of are the votes there? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you allow these small factions to kind of drag their feet, drag their feet, demand things, move the goalposts, pretend that they're trying, and then go tweet that they're or whatever, exit or whatever you call it. Yeah, right. Pretend that they're negotiating when they're not. And at some point, it, you you got to have the votes. And that goes in the House, that goes in the Senate as well. And so maybe, uh, you know, maybe the sort of frustration and the hard work kind of leads us to that sort of basic legislative uh, process to say, okay, here's what we think it should be. You know, don't, don't just stand out there and bash it in the press. Bring an amendment. Let's debate it. Let's see who's got the votes, and then we move on, and then we move forward. Um, you know, I'd like to think that could happen. I, I, I'm not necessarily going to uh, bet on it, but uh, but I do think there's 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 a chance for something like that to be actually very uh, valuable for the policy itself, and maybe even the politics here. If we don't see something done in what two months. Four months? Are we done until 2025? So we've got probably till early July, right? I think okay. that July 4th recess is going to be a pretty, like, the door closes nearly immediately after that because we go into the, the full-on crazy season of campaigns. And, and the presidential election obviously is going to have such a huge, uh, it's going to take up a lot of oxygen and energy. Um we don't have to necessarily get it all the way done. I hate to say this, but I do think you can get far enough along the process to allow for a lame duck, but uh, that probably requires some version of 
getting through committees and maybe even one or both floors um, by July 4th. I mean, I think we're okay. I think that's a, that's going to be a tough uh, stretch after that. Now they'll have some, they'll have a couple of weeks to work maybe in July, but. Pretty limited. All right. I got to let you get to class. Jonathan, thank you so much for squeezing me in today. I appreciate it. Thanks, boss. Good to talk to you. I, I, I love the questions. Those are great. Uh, maybe, maybe we maybe we have a philosophical discussion. One day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're just here to chat. All right. Jonathan Coppice, University of Illinois. Thank you much. Thank you. My thanks to Jonathan for squeezing us in right before class started one day this winter as we discussed the farm bill. Hey, a couple of weeks ago, we had the end of the podcast where we asked for items to be mailed to us that could be on display at our podcast table, which right here where my arm is, you may soon see in future episodes. What has been sent in? What has made the cut? Send us uh, anything that you think would be kind of a fun display case, whether it's a old tin or bobblehead, ashtray, coffee cup. I have some pictures that are going to be coming soon. Send it to M2M Podcast in care of Iowa PBS, P.O. Box 6450, Johnston, Iowa, 50131. Thank you. We'll see you next time on the M2M Show Podcast.